Good morning. I know a few people are still having a little trouble getting here to this morning, but we're going to go ahead and get started. The, uh, um, this is Ohio weather for you, I guess, under a climate change scenario. So um, uh, thank you for taking your time to join us today for today's program, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion within the Environmental Movement. My name is Jeff Sharp. I'm the director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources, and we're delighted to be able to host this particular event today. If you're not signed up to receive automatic updates for the Environmental Professionals Network, if this is your first time, please consider doing so. Um, go to epn.osu.edu so you do not miss uh, future events. We have a great program of um, uh, activities scheduled yet for this academic year, and we're already planning for next year. We are so excited to welcome Marcelo Bonta to Ohio State. Please take a moment to read Marcelo's extensive bio professional bio located in the program brochure at your table. Um, he flew in from Oregon, and he's still kind of in a, a Pacific time, so uh, um, if he uh, um, stumbles a bit, understand that he's still waking up, um, although he seems wide awake here now. So we appreciate all the work Marcelo has done in advance for this program, including the short video we presented at last month's breakfast. I'd also like to thank the EPN team for all its work preparing for this event as well. Uh, this was a challenging event for our team to pull off. Um, there's quite a few activities scheduled over the next two days, and so big shout out to uh, uh, Nicole Jackson, our new EPN coordinator, who uh, has only been with us a month, and she jumped right in and sort of like really took the lead on this. And thank you to all the others of the, uh, um, uh, of the team who um, contributed to this. Marcella will not only be sharing his Jedi message via the upcoming keynote presentation, but will be, which you'll see in a few minutes, but he also crafted a, few, a series of workshops that some of you will be sticking around to participate in uh, after the conclusion of this program. Uh, we're delighted that uh, um, many of you are going to be um, sticking around with us, and there'll be another workshop tomorrow as well focused on individual change and growth within the Jedi movement at the Ohio Union. I was told we hit our 70-person capacity for these workshops, and we really appreciate, we appreciate the response we receive from the community for these activities. Just as an aside, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to sort of like uh, coordinate this with a number of you. When I first started as director five and a half, six years ago, when I was doing the tours, uh, I can tell you that I know in talking to a number of our constituents, or at least uh, partners in the school, uh, people identified this as a priority area. Um, it's great that we now have a chance to sort of come together and sort of like co-sponsor an event. I want to give a shout out to Larry Peck, who um, indicated that to me many years ago that the uh, Metro Parks was very committed to this. And the very first time I met Heather with OEC, um, she was touting the importance of diversity. So it's great that we have a chance to come together and um, take this advantage, uh, take advantage of this. In the meantime, despite us not collaborating in the last couple years, I can share you through the school that we've um, committed substantially to this. I'm delighted that we have a number of junior faculty here today that um, are committed to this. And the reason I point to the junior faculty is we have adopted in our hiring practices in the school that a candidate that's going to apply for a position has to write a diversity statement explaining how they're committed to diversity. And I really think um, that has authentically translated into us having people in the school that we've hired that are committed to this. So uh, I appreciate all the partners and all your commitments to this, and I'm delighted that we've had a chance to come together today. One item that is always at the front of our minds in the School of Environment and Natural Resources the, uh, is um, the quality of the experience, both academic and extra extracurricular, for our undergrad and graduate students. In that spirit, we so appreciate the time and space that Nicole, Marcella, and the rest of our planning team created for conversations directly involving students of color to discuss topics regarding barriers and inequities of working in the environmental movement and to review opportunities for students to build support networks in our community. These conversations will occur tonight and tomorrow and we hope that Marcelo's facilitation will help others open the door for future dialogue and systems for support and growth in this space. Um, I believe Tamala Ayepo Mfendi that's a mouthful. Um, the events coordinator for the Ohio Environmental Council will be assisting with this effort as well. Thank you to Tamala Ayepo for being part of the work to connect directly with our students. If you would like more information about these specific programs, there are flyers located in the registration area. On the topic of student support, we do want to extend a thanks to all of those here who registered and sponsored a student. We have quite a few students with us today, and as our goal is to always uh, facilitate networking between professionals and students, uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, would all the students in the room please raise their hand? If you have a chance, if you're an environmental professional, you have a round of applause. If you're an environmental professional, we'd encourage you to take time to sort of step up after the program and visit with these students. Many of them are, aspire to have careers in this field, and your support is very important. The activities of today and tomorrow are part of an effort to organize a broader community across our state in support of JEDI efforts. And we really appreciate several entities that stepped up to show their support through direct contributions for hosting program, the, today's program, including the Columbus, Franklin, Columbus and Franklin County Metro Parks, the Shearmar Olentangy River Wetland Research Park, the Sustainability Institute at Ohio State University, and the Nature Conservancy of Ohio. Many of these organizations have staff 
committed to participate fully in both the full two work days of JEDI workshops, and I look forward to where our shared experience will lead us in taking future actions. To introduce our speaker and to provide some remarks on their organizational perspective on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and the environmental movement is Miranda Lepla, the clean energy attorney for Ohio Environmental Council. I've known for some years and I have been hearing from Joe and Nicole for months about the commitment of OEC has dem demonstrated to the field of diversity and inclusion. They are our co-host of this program and we are so impressed with their work in the, this field so far. They help pay an import, play an important role in getting Marcelo here to Columbus. We have nearly the entire OEC staff, I believe it's officially 27 attending the workshops, participating in this two-day conversation. Thank you, Ohio Environmental Council. Your leadership is so appreciated in this space, uh, and your work is having an impact. Without further delay, please welcome uh, Randy Lepla. Thank you, Jeff. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm Randy Lepla. I'm the clean energy attorney at the OEC and a member of Team JEDI, our OEC committee dedicated to ensuring justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion are focal points in our organization and in our work uh, in the environmental space. Um, the OEC is celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and over the course of those 50 years, OEC staff has worked on more environmental justice issues than we can count. Yet our movement still struggles to be equitable and inclusive. Because injustice and exclusion were part of the environmental movement from its very origin, just as they're a part of our nation's history, racism and classism are embedded in everything that we do. To address this, OEC determine, is determined to take a more intentional approach to recognizing and addressing structural racism and equity as an, as an organization, and to make our, the environmental movement and OEC's work more inclusive, more diverse, and more equitable. The OEC has examined and revised our internal and external policies and value statements to reflect the inequitable realities of our movement and made revisions aimed at increasing participation and inclusion of underrepresented and underconnected groups. We're in the midst of drafting a plan aimed at raising up marginalized voices in communities throughout Ohio. And we're here today because we're dedicated to removing internal barriers to becoming a more diverse and inclusive organization and are dedicated to continuing to learn and educate ourselves on how to be better partners and better allies to frontline organizations and marginalized communities in our state. We were thrilled to team up with OSU, School of Environment and Natural Resources, to co-host this important workshop and to be part of bringing an advocate and facilitator of the caliber of Marcelo Bonta to Columbus. Marcelo, as you probably all know and can read in your brochures, um, is a leader in the environmental justice space and founder of the Center for Diversity and the Environment. He was originally trained as a conservation biologist, but he pivoted and dedicated his career to addressing the lack of diversity in the environmental movement. Today, he brings almost two decades of experience facilitating individual, organizational, and systemic DEI change processes through his consulting work, including organizational strategy, coaching, advising, trainings like this one, and leadership development programs. We're excited to learn strategies to make our organization and movement more equitable and inclusive and to improve ourselves as individuals to be the best partners we can be. Because being a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environmental movement will make us the strongest movement possible. So with that, please help me welcome Marcelo Bonta. Good morning, everybody. I have my hands full here. Um, I am trying a few new things. So one is I just got glasses, so I'm nearsighted. So I want to see you first before I start reading. So um, what a beautiful crowd. What a beautiful crowd. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for spending time. You could be doing something else like I keep on thinking of sleeping. So you could be doing something else, like sleeping, eating, working, and you decided to be here. So that in of itself, of the time you choose to spend where and how is really, really important. Um, and I would ask you to continue to do that as you continue to grow and do more work around JEDI as you continue to move forward and try to advance the very goals around environmental protection that we're all here together for. Um, so that's the first new thing. I'm going to take that off. Um, the second new thing is um, I'm trying, I'm going to start doing some things. Re I'm reading my, my notes off of an iPad. Um, the church I go to has a 30-something pastor who's very cool and hip 
that, that Portland hipster vibe a little too much. But um, he, he works off an iPad. I'm like, oh, I got to do that. I got to do that. So I'm trying for the first time, pushing myself. So if something goes awry, I do have a couple backup plans. But if you see a kind of a small pause, like, oh, it froze or something like that, that's why. Um, I also want to just, I want to thank Jeff and Randy. Thank you for your, for your wonderful introductions. Um, thank you to OSU, thank you to OS, OEC for being um, co-hosts, thank you to the other sponsors. Um, I know it takes a lot to organize uh, a couple of days. Um, I'm usually on that side of organizing it, so I really appreciate that there's other people doing that, and I could really focus on the content, I could focus on meeting you where you're at, and I could focus on helping you through your learning and growth process. Um, so. As you know, um, I am based in, in Portland, Oregon. So I was starting to think about, before I came out here, I'm like, oh, Ohio State, this will be awesome. I've only been driven through the state once. Um, I had a great aunt uh, who passed away, but she lived in Kent, Ohio, so I kind of passed through there. Um, and I was trying to think, do I have any Buckeye friends? And unfortunately, I do I didn't. I had a couple of friends from Ohio, but not Buckeyes. So I just want to let you know, actually, through this process of the last few months, um, I have a couple of friends now. And after the next couple of days, I'm looking forward to having a whole swath of friends as well as a family. And, 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 and one thing and one perspective around doing Jedi work is, is thinking about you have a family. You know, sometimes we get along. Sometimes we don't. How do you be in relationship with others, no matter who they are, and how do you work and effectively communicate and connect and work effectively across difference? So um, I know I have a new family here. So, so I do have a few friends that are Wolverines, though. Um, so I was expecting some booze there. There's no booze. I'm, I'm trying to gauge the rivalry. I know there's a huge rivalry, right? Um, so he actually quickly humbled, one of my friends quickly humbled himself when I was asking him, and I was telling him, I'm going to Ohio State, what's up with the rivalry? And he said, well, Ohio State football has some long winning streak. I can't even count anymore against us. So a seven game winning streak, and then 14 of the last 15? Uh, that's, I don't think that's much of a rivalry, do you? It's like, some dominance on one end. But he did quickly tell me that Mich the basketball team, Michigan's won the past two, so he's got to be excited about something, I guess. Um, so I, I'm, actually, I'm actually a soccer fan. So I've, I've, I played in college, and I played a little bit professionally. Um, big Portland Timbers fan. I'm sorry about 2015. Someone had to win. Um, so Columbus Crew. I'm looking forward to the Columbus Crew and FC Cincinnati new rivalry. I'm up for rivalries all the time. And I think I found my second favorite team now in, in, the, in the crew because you guys just hired our old Portland Timbers coach who won, who won it in 2015. So hopefully he'll win it for you. Um, he's a great guy. So we are in a time and place of a really a lot massive transformation transformation around us. Our planet is changing, our weather is changing, um, our politics are encountering, we're encountering things we've never seen before. Um, technology is advancing at a rapid pace. We're trying to keep up with that. And, and our demographics are changing in this country. Um, by mid-century, our nation will be over 50% people of color. So as a movement, what are we doing now to prepare ourselves, not only to be effective now, because I'm going to talk about some numbers uh, in a little bit, but, but how do we prepare ourselves to continually be effective and relevant far into the mid-century uh, when our nation is over 50% people of color. So the one exciting thing I want to share is just kind of give you this movement-wide perspective, and because I've been doing and in, in, in looking at this, this Jedi work for the past couple decades. I think there's some things to be excited about. Um, the last four years, um, I've, there's been movement and advancement in Jedi and the environmental movement nationally at, at, at rates we've never seen before. Um, just way more environmental organizations are taking up the mantle and moving this work forward. Foundations who are a little bit behind, they're always kind of a little bit behind in supporting what, what we're all doing on the ground. 
they're starting to give dollars and funds. I'm trying to help support some of those foundations and there's a growing space. So some of you who have been hoping to do this work but just can't find the resources, th there's hope there, things are changing. Um, so I wanna say that, that really in the last four years, and you could argue there's been kind of movement getting to this point today for the, over the last decade. Um, while there has been great advancements, we're still at the beginning stages in the environmental movement. Um, and there's a long, long way to go. So um, hopefully I can give some light to the situation today. Hope encourage you to, to move to start or move forward and advance in your journey in effective ways um, as I give you um, some words of hopefully wisdom as we go through the day. So some quick background. So this term's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, JEDI, keeps on being said. So I just wanna give you quickly what I mean when I say these terms. And this is actually gonna be something, for those of you who stick around for the workshop, we're gonna explore a little bit more. So it's really important to being on the same page, especially with your organization or the teams you work with, around what do you mean around these terms. Um, so what I share is just my, are my personal definitions. Um, and I think it's important for you ha <clears throat> to have your discussions with your teams and organizations of what do you mean when you say equity, especially equity. Equity is one of those newer words, which the beauty of diversity is that we all have um, a multitude of perspectives and approaches of who we are that, that are connected to our experiences and our identities and how we, we move around in the world. So especially around equity, there's a lot of, um, a lot of different personal definitions of what it means. I've been in spaces where um, even the word, word equity, one person saying, this is equity, another person saying, no, that's not equity, this is equity. And, and you know who's right? It's actually, they're both right, right? There's multiple rights, but, but what needs to happen is a discussion of what they can agree on when they're saying equity. Um, and there's more to that. I'll talk about more of that in, in our workshop. But here, here's where I come from. Justice is um, equality and fairness. It's usually the upfront uh, treatment of, of fairness and equality for, for all people. Equity is more on the quality of the outcome or impact. So for me, it's more of the analysis that will in, in, inform the how and the why. Um, one unique way of, that I look at it is thinking about it interpersonally and on teams. How does power and privilege and our multiple identities interact? Who has power and privilege, who doesn't? And what do you do in that situation to remedy um, that power and privilege? Uh, diversity is the what, our makeup all the ways in which we are different, similar, and unique. Um, inclusion is, is really the how and the behavior. So how do you create a space where all people, all people can bring their full selves to the table? And I think that'd be, that's an important question to ask when you're thinking, excuse me, when you're thinking about inclusion. Um, the other piece I wanna, I wanna mention is that I will be focusing uh, when I talk about justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, I'm, fo I'm gonna be focusing on race and ethnicity. That's my background, uh, that's my experience, that's where I feel I can provide the most wisdom to you all in this space. And, and I want to also say that there are multiple other, um, other dimensions of diversity that are really important to address. Um, gender issues, socioeconomic issues, geographic issues. Um, that are really important as part of this conversation. Um, and so I don't want to get caught in this, this hierarchy of oppression, which is more oppressed or, in, or, 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 or which, which identity is more oppressed. Um, they're all important and all, all face oppression. And just we have points in our, our, our lives where we get to choose. Do we want to look at all forms of oppression and go this deep? Or do we want to focus on one or two at a time and go this deep in understanding? And, and we need more spaces and more conversations to go this deep. Um, because a lot of the discussions we have stay at this surface level. And in order to find solutions, we need to get, go deep into what are those challenges and problems. Um, all right. So um, these are just some images of, to sh share with you a little bit about who I am, who are, who are some of my heroes growing up. Thank you. Um, and 
first, um, I was born in Bakersfield, California. Um, and it was at a time my parents, my mom's Filipino, my dad's white American. Uh, my parents were working for the United Farm Worker Labor Movement. So um, I came home in a, and lived in a trailer, three trailers down from Cesar Chavez's home, which in concept is awesome, but I don't remember anything at all. Um, <laughs> I asked my dad, I'm like, can you send me some, some pictures I could share? Like, I'm just like a, a baby or a bundle or something like that. And he's, so he sent me all these pictures of my brother and sister with, with <laughs> like, it's not, I, I thought about sharing with you and maybe like my brother and I look kind of similar. I kind of tricked you or something like that. Um, but um, I'd like to think that, <laughs> that maybe some of my justice perspective and stuff I got through osmosis being, being that close to, to Cesar Chavez. But actually in reality, my, my parents are amazing people. Not only did they work in the farm worker labor movement, my dad marched in the civil rights movement. My mom um, was, I grew up in Sacramento, California. My mom was, is a huge leader in the Filipino community. She doesn't even live there anymore. And she keeps on getting invited back for awards and banquets and all types of things. So that's, that's how much the Sacramento community loves, loves my mother. And so me and my brother and sister have all followed some type of service or justice oriented um, careers. Um, my brother's a politician, don't hold him to it. I, I would like to think he's one of the good ones, but there is bias probably act, act coming up there. So a couple of other um, heroes. So I, my day-to-day -day getting outside of the house was, was through soccer. So I know it's not nature, but it got me out to the grassy fields. It leveled the playing field for me. I was this small brown guy living in a predominantly white suburb. Um, and what sport can I do? I'm like, well, there's this five, six, five, seven dude, Diego Maradona, best player in the world that plays soccer. I'm like, oh, I'm about, I'm brown and I'm short. Maybe I should play soccer. <laughs> um, so one of my idols. Um, and then um, my window to the outdoors was uh, Marty Stouffer's Wild America. Who remembers? Or maybe still watches, accesses some old ones. If you access it, let me know. I want to. I want to bring it back. So, so this is my window to the outdoors. So I was the one kid um, in my family um, that lo loved nature. Like I could watch these shows forever. I could look out of my backyard and just stare at squirrels. My dad has stories like, yeah, I used to just go out in the back and pick up rocks, dig boulders, and you just stared at like ants and roly polies and stuff. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like he's trying, to, he's trying to say like, I don't know what's going on with you, but I'm like, oh, that sounds right. That's awesome. What did I find out, Dad? That's great. Um, so this is my window to actually connect to nature because as, as a family, we didn't get out to nature a lot. Um, we were pretty busy going from soccer game to soccer game. So I would go to the second TV in my parents' room. You guys all remember kind of those two, well, not all, not all of you, some of you, the young people. What are you talking about? This is kind of like the 10 inch tube TV with the big knob. I had to go to like UHF. I can't even remember all that stuff. Big rabbit ears, um, the kind of fuzzy snow. I'd be able to get, you know, a little bit of pictures of Marty Stouffer and these cute little otters or fishers or something like that. So that, that, that's where I engaged in my, my love for the outdoors and why I ended up going into conservation biology. And, you know, at this moment, I'm just going to say, MC Hammer was an idol. I don't have to go into too much detail. Yes, I did wear hammer pants at one time. Um, and, but I am a proud 80s hip hop dancer. So I could, I could bring it up. And I'm also, what, the other reason why I'm proud is because the young ones these days try to do 80s hip hop. It's just not the same. I just want to let you know that. If you ever want to know what it should be like, maybe we should go out dancing. OK, so. Um, Piping plover. So this was my, this was and gosh, I should say I always say is my favorite job. This I pretty much like my job now too. But I would just say one of my favorite jobs was in grad school. Um, I got the pleasure of monitoring endangered and threatened um, piping plovers and other seabirds along the Massachusetts coastline. Um, and I thought I thought this was it. I'm like this is the life. This is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Um, until, my, until my wife was kind of like, 
we were dating at the time. She's kind of like, well, you know, you got to be around family too. as so you grow up. I'm like, I know, but there's family there. Look at the little guys. They're so cute. I have to help protect them and monitor them. So, um, so I want I want to just share that because I love um, this. This is why I got into this work was to, to protect wildlife, um, to do conservation work. Um, and unfortunately, my first job out of grad school, so after this, was, was for a national conservation organization based out of Portland. So I was in their field office, and I knew coming in, there's only six people, so I knew coming in I was the only person of color that's going to be working for them. Um, quickly, within the first week, this was actually a field office, and there was a national group. I quickly found out that I was the only person of color working on the conservation staff across, across the country. So that led me, this was 2000, and that led me on this journey of just, just wondering why. Why is there such a lack of diversity, equity, inclusion in the environmental movement? Why am I the only? Why do I, whenever I go to workshops, or back then, and still today, go to workshops and conferences, I, I bump into other people of color who are the onlys or one of the few in their organizations. And I want to say that this was a couple decades ago. Um, but this, this challenge is still so pervasive. Um, and, and I am privy to um, some conversations, uh, confidential conversations with people of color. I started the Environmental Professionals of Color Network, so a network of over a couple thousand people across the country. And I have really special and close relationships with a lot of people of color. And a lot of people of color just talk to me because of my connection to that network. And I hear stories. <laughs> I hear stories very similar to mine, where, um, where I experienced overt and, and, overt and covert racism um, in, in that position. I, I felt very, very isolated. I underperform. I'm the type of person that overperforms. I'm an overachiever. It's like honors, AP, went to Ivy League school, um, played for the state team soccer, played in college, Division I, played some professional. So whatever I did, I'm pushing myself. And just that time at that one organization, my performance just went, it just, it just crashed. It was lowest point of my career. And it didn't serve, that, that experience didn't serve me well, and it definitely didn't serve the organization or the mission well. And it, and, and it took me a while to realize, you know, it was just the situation. It wasn't me. And, and there was a lot, I had to go through a lot to figure out that it wasn't me. It wasn't my fault. I do have a role to play, but it wasn't on my shoulders. And what happens is this story continues to happen. And some, some stories to, to more serious degrees, where it's just overt, overt, overt racism. I just can't believe actually it happens in this world, in the environmental movement but these stories do not come to light because they're so personal and, and, and I don't bring them to light because they're confidential and I respect the people who, who shared them with me. But I wanna share this because this is not talked about. This is not said. And just understanding that for, for people with oppressed identities and, and it would, it's not just people of color in the movement, um, those with oppressed identities have, have struggles and challenges working in this dominant culture environmental movement. So we must, if, if we really want to achieve the very mission that we're all here for, your organizational mission, we have to do Jedi right. Another reason why, <coughs> why I do this work, so that's a big reason why I do this work, you can tell, my heart came out there, um, uh, that, that, that I'm, I'm fighting for the other onlys and the other to, to, to make sure that there's a great, they have a great and positive experience. Um, another reason why I do this on a personal level are, are my daughters. So um, cut, I have two teenagers now, as of a month ago. Um, Stella's 13, um, the photo bomber down there. She still has that same personality. Um, and Kyra is 16. And when I started on this journey, they were just getting born. And um, it was when they were younger I was so happy um, that they were following the green dad habits, you know, they're becoming little green kids, turning off the water, turning off the lights, 
um, and love loving hiking. So that, that's our family thing to do. And still to this day, it's what do you want to do? Let's go for a hike. When we go on vacation, what do you want to do? Let's go for a hike. So that's that's when we come together. It's 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 um, it's a spiritual thing. It's exercise. As my daughter actually, I think it was actually on this hike. Um, she's like four or five years old. Said, um, "Daddy, I love hiking. It's exercise." <laughs> and and at first, if you know her now, she has a way with the words. At first, I was like, "Oh, what a cute like mistake!" But it makes so much sense. There's so much so much more than just exercise. But knowing her now, she's and she's super smart. I was like, "Oh, she probably meant that on purpose." <laughs> Let's give Daddy something to talk about at his talks. Um, so um, so yeah. So my girl. So so our nation actually. Next year, 2020, our nation will be, our, our, our kids in this nation under the age of 18 will be over 50% people of color. So that, that's my girl's generation. So what I see, what are on my shoulders, what I'm asking you is what are we doing to prepare the next generation that's gonna come behind us? How can we create this space and set them up for success so they can build upon what we've done already and take us to the next level. So that is one of the many challenges we have around Jedi. The, the other reason why on a personal level I think we must be doing Jedi is I just don't think we can have be successful. Um, I could argue um, that we're actually not being very successful these days. But gosh, when I first came into the movement 20 years ago, I would see these lists of what are the top 10 issues that, you know, that are recommended for politicians to talk about. Environment was always in the top 10, top 10. And then it was kind of like the early 2000s, it fell off. And no one ever talks about it anymore because it hasn't been, I don't know how it is locally or, or in Ohio, but I haven't seen these top 10 lists where it says the environment is something that should be talked about and addressed in policies. Um, so I, I, that needs to change. Um, and, and one way of getting there is by addressing and connecting to a broader swath of people, um, and it's gonna lead to us achieving our missions at a much higher success rate, and I'll talk a little bit about that and how we'll do that. Um, so here's some other arguments for why JEDI is important. Um, it's our moral responsibility. Uh, it's not only the right thing to do, it's the wise thing to do. Numerous studies have continued to show that diversity, when managed for its diversity, so when it's, when it's managed in an inclusive manner, have a higher level of success, perform at higher rates than, than other groups. And there's one very study that talks about, um, that shows three different types of groups. It's a homogenous group, uh, there's a diverse group managed for its diversity, and there's a diverse group not managed for its diversity. Um, so when they looked at the performance of these three groups, the middle performing group is actually the homogenous group. The lowest performing group is the diverse group not managed for its diversity, and the highest performing group is the diverse group managed for its diversity. So there's a couple things I want to really point out there. One is our demographics are changing. So no matter what, we're becoming more and more diverse. So not only is there a choice there for us to make to, to do Jedi work, but it's also the smart thing to do um, because if we don't do it well, we're gonna be lower performing. So just think about, we've been this homogenous movement, had this homogenous culture for, for forever in, in post-European settlement environmental conservation movement. Um, and so we put a ceiling on what success can be like for us, right? The highest we can go is second place in this study. We can only go as high as the homogenous group. Don't you wanna to get to that number one? I'm always shooting for number one. So let's get to number one, because there's, there's, there's an outlet there for do, us doing this work, and Jedi is about how you do your work. And it's, and it's about being more effective at your work, and I think I, w I, w I would like to meet the person here who does not want to be more effective, right? So here's a pathway to more effectiveness and more success. And to be honest with you, I can't even imagine what that success would look like for us because it's beyond anything we've ever experienced before. 
So how do we create a movement where we don't need me up here speaking? We don't need these organizations, these consultants doing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, helping support environmental groups. We don't need, what about a future where we don't need environmental groups? Because environmentalism is being infused in everything we do. Where we don't need justice organizations because justice is being infused in everything we do and how we operate and it's part of our culture. It's kind of hard to believe now, but it's, I, I truly believe that it's possible. And it takes me and you to get us there. Um, now, I talked about changing demographics. Um, a few other studies that are out there, I talked about 2020 is our child population. Anywhere from 2033 to 2045, uh, there's been estimates that our US population will be over 50% people of color. Um, back in 2011, it was actually the first um, year post-European settlement that babies born in the U.S. were over 50% people of color. I think there are a lot of babies of color being born before Europeans settled North America. So again, again there, there's a lesson there because that was the narrative that was being said, right? So we have to be, we have to be very cognizant of the narratives that are being shared and the, even the narratives that we move forward within the movement of what is true and what is not true, right? Because there was an additional piece to that story around, around, around uh, babies who are over 50% people of color for the first time. Um, no, not really. Maybe for the first time since, I don't know, 1800. Um, so something to continue to think about. And, and as you continue to do this Jedi work, the, those thoughts and questions were, will continue to come up for you. Okay. So um, here's, here's a couple pie graphs just showing, the, and the dates are wrong. My PowerPoint is updated and didn't let me change dates. Um, and that's also how um, beginner I am on technology. So, so really, 2018. Uh, the latest estimate is that people of color are 38% of the nation. And now the, the, the U.S. Census Bureau estimates that by 2045, um, people of color will be over 50%. Uh, people, uh, the, the U.S. will be over 50% people of color. Um, I want to share a couple other stats with you as well. So first of all, that's over 120 million people in this country. Uh, and I want to say these numbers because we as a mainstream environmental movement struggle and have not done a great job of working with um, people of color. And we think about across the US, 120 million people is a lot of people to be leaving out. Um, and, by, and by 2050, that actually that number is gonna, gonna about double to 236 million people of color. So it's a great opportunity to engage and connect now. In Ohio, about 21% 20 of the population are people of color. Uh, and it's about 2.45 million people. In Columbus, it's around 43% of your population are people of color. Uh, and it's about 340,000 people. So, um, so I wanna share, hopefully this, this, hopefully I'm not stretching you too much. Hopefully you'll get this. So. If you're serving only one population, white people, I know it's not intentional, but you see that in the outcomes of who's engaging. If you're only serving um, white people, if you look at this country, that means you're only really serving like 60%, 62% of the nation at best, right? To intentionally be doing that. So um, Brian Fantana, one of the characters from Anchorman, is it anybody's favorite movie? I don't know, anybody know that one? Uh, Ron Burgundy, that's what they got. So here's his quote. His quote is, so, so actually, so first of all, 60%, it's like a D minus. Well, I can't deal with a D minus. We gotta do better, unless you're Brian Fantana. And he says, 60% of the time it works every time. <laughs> so if you're happy with that, then then you could keep on going the way we're going. But I think a lot of you are, are looking for, for ways to do better. Um, and, and, I, and, and I wanna say this too, it's, it's no, I know it's no one's intention in here to be leaving out 
40% of the population. Um, and, and we need to start having this conversation on, on the impact or outcome, though. What is actually happening? How are we serving and working with communities of color? How are we creating these spaces for people of color to flourish within our organizations? And I'll tell you something, it means you've got to do things differently. So if you're not doing things differently, then you're not setting up people of color for success. You're not setting yourself up for success. You're not setting up the partnerships for success. Um, because the way uh, we've been operating in the environmental movement is very dominant culture approach. And um, that's a workshop to talk about, to dive deeper into what does that mean? What do you mean, Marcelo, about dominant culture approach? Just come to the workshop and, and we'll dabble in there. Okay, so I'm kind of, I don't like putting all types of numbers on, on a big PowerPoint, but, but, but I'm gonna. And, and, and this is why. This is a poll, and I know there's some TNC folks in here. TNC? Okay, some TNC folks. Back around 2010, TNC um, commissioned this, this poll. And it was looking at, it, it, at the time, and up until like the last couple of years, it was the only uh, poll or survey looking at the concern of Americans based on race and ethnicity. And what it shows, I mean, you, you could try and look at it, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it for you, but like we have concern for um, pollution, global warming, loss of habitat or fish and wildlife, loss of natural areas. So here's where whites are concerned, and here's where all voters of color are concerned. And what you'll see is for most categories, except for one, that voters of color are more concerned about environmental issues at 14 to 22 percentage points higher. That is a huge gap. I'm not someone that works a lot in politics, but people who do tell me, tell me that's like a landslide gap. That is a huge gap. Um, the one area where it's even is loss of working farms and ranches. And this is just one example of over a couple of dozen that I found, and there's more than that out there in terms of surveys and polls that continue to show that people of color are concerned and care about environmental issues at higher rates than whites. And if there's one community of color that's even, that continues to stand out more than the others, it's Latinos. Um, so how many of you, is this kind of information that I'm sharing with you, is this the first time you're seeing something like this? Maybe maybe a little, maybe maybe sixty percent of the crowd just raised their hand. How many of you think this is actually for our work that we do is really really important for us to be successful at our work? Yeah, most of you raise, raise your hand there. Um, this is important. This is this is crucial information. And here here's the here's the sad thing about. Um, Here's the story of actually this study. So I know the person out in the Nature Conservancy who helped make this happen. And it was about a couple months afterwards and I'm like, hey, I'm putting a link on my website. Can you, I can't find the link, can you give me the link? And she said, well, I, there's no link. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's broken or something? She's like, no, there's just, it's not up on our website anymore. I was like, what are you talking about? Um, and she said, yeah, it's, it was, it was kind of like on some of the, the front page or kind of the more obvious page for the first day or two. Then it got pushed back and back, and then they decided to just take it off. And, and this is kind of, this is really, this, got, this, this just makes me think there's other things happening here. Um, systems that are, um, that we're, we're fighting against around this work. But it's like, why do you take something off? It's like websites keep things on forever, sometimes too, too long, right? It's usually the other, other, other challenge. So, and especially for information like this. Um, so I told her, I'm like, give me the, this is when we had CD-ROMs and stuff like that. Um, and I said, give it to me, I'll, I'll just put it on our website and just keep it there. Um, but if you think this is important information, please um, bring it to light. Bring it into your work. How does it affect your approach? How does it affect your analysis? How do you bring it up and bring it up with, with your partners around, hey, look at this. So, so the one thing that I always encounter in working with other environmentalists is um, the problem of preaching to the choir. Hey, we keep on preaching to the choir. 
Um, I don't know if we're pushing or making change. We keep on, keep on preaching the choir. I just want to let you know there's a whole other choir out there that we're not preaching to. We're not even, we're arguably, for the most, because I know there's some, some groups and some individuals building relationships, but for the most part as a movement, we're not even looking to be in the same room lots of times or even thinking about that this is an important constituency when we're trying to, to co-create a bill, especially around climate change. And there's a lot of, lot of actually that happening in, in local and state levels across the country. Trying to coordinate everything. iPad, computer, it's coming together. So um, I, I don't expect you to, to read down this list. The, the point is I just wanted to share some of the challenges on the organizational as well as institutional and cultural levels. I want to go through these slides pretty quickly. Um, but you know, this actually, me and my founding board chair uh, at the Center for Diversity and the Environment, gosh, about 10, 12 years ago, we actually we, we created this slide. We brainstormed, hey, what are the challenges? And, this, and these slides are still here today. I actually did a, I added a couple things at the end, but for the most part, it hasn't changed. So there's a lot of challenges um, that, that continue, that we continue to face that are preventing us of moving forward on, on JEDI. And, and again, addressing these and diving into this is, is, is a workshop or is, is actually what I do when I consult directly with, with organizations. We start looking at what are some of those barriers and what are the opportunities to move the work forward. And I, I'm gonna, in a little bit, I'm gonna, I will address some of these issues will, will pop up um, in a little bit. And this is stuff that's just more institutional and cultural. Um, I think one of the things that has come up for me lately is a lot of these, um, these mistruths in these narratives that are destructive, like down in the, the, cut, the two at the bottom, uh, like the belief that there's only one right way and one narrative, like especially one narrative to protect the environment. And, and I think um, that there are a lot of tribes and in indigenous cultures who've actually been doing sustainability for a long time, and there's a reason why you find biodiversity in places like the Amazon and places where Europeans settled, is because they actually were managing the diversity, biodiversity, before we um, Europeans uh, arrived. More, there, there's more there, there's always more. Um, I, I just want to share this thing, <laughs> my beautiful artwork. So I'm, I'm working on some things like creating these tools and things to be able to um, think through. Um, so I, I, I'm, I gotta get a graphic designer to, actually I've just started talking to someone to help bring this to light. Right now it's my beautiful artwork. Um, and what I, I call this the Jedi Triangle. So when you're thinking about, oftentimes groups come to me, hey, what do we need to be doing on this work? So I pull out, well, I've started to the last couple of months, uh, this Jedi Triangle, and it's based on the, uh, the Global Diversity and Inclusion Benchmarks Initiative. Um, and what it shows is oftentimes organizations focus on either the internal and or external. So they see the sides of the triangle. What can we do externally? Building relationships with communities of color, partnering, bringing in Jedi into our programs. Um, what can we do internally, creating an inclusive culture, working on recruitment and retention and representation. Um, and, and what often is missed is this foundational, the base of the triangle that upholds the effectiveness and upholds the rest of the work on the internal and external work. So some of those foundational things are creating a high functioning, inclusive DEI team. Um, Creating, so forgive me, I'm, I'm using DEI interchangeably with JEDI right now. Um, I have to start updating all my, all my stuff to, to more of this JEDI work. So creating a DEI statement, really being clear why, uh, being clear of what your, what your vision is, your desired future state, what's your current state. Got a lot of stuff that, that organizations will do with, as they go through strategic planning, but really doing it with a diversity, equity, inclusion um, lens. And, and this, this we're, we're gonna do more within the workshop, um, especially today's workshop. So, 
I want to get a point in this presentation that I call top 10 pro tips taking Jedi to the next level. So these are, um, I, it's interesting because I'm like, oh, I have so much to say. Let me do a top 10 list. And I brainstorm like 25 things. I'm like, oh, I got to bring it down to 10. Um, so these are some um, that I feel that what, what I'm going to share with you are a lot of common things I share with organizations of helping them address and move through barriers or challenges, whether it's, um, yeah, so, so actually I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and then I'll let the, uh, the next slide speak for themselves. I'm going to grab some water real quick. Okay. I'm going to go, it's kind of like, again, I'm gonna, those of you who know David Letterman, I'm going to do like a countdown, 10 to 1. Um, again, not t total order. I like to put the number one and two be as one and two, but the others are kind of in there randomly. Um, so one, be like the Colorado River. Um, so if you see on the left, this is where the Colorado, this is, this is the headwaters of the Colorado River. This guy's standing, straddling the Colorado River. So it starts small. And it gets big, as many of you know, as it moves through the Grand Canyon. And it carves its way, it's carved its way through the Grand Canyon for millions and billions of years. So what, what am I trying to say here? Um, in doing the Jedi work, start small. Start small. Start um, growing, stop, start learning. And as you continue to do that and are committed to the growth of doing that work, your understanding, your capacity, and your effectiveness will, will be exponentially more vast as you continue to do this work. Um, a lot of people who I work with um, who've come through my trainings or I'm working with them in organizations, they share that there are some things they know they know around Jedi. There's things that they know that they don't know. And there's, as they continue to grow in this work, they continue to learn a lot of things they didn't know that they didn't know. So initially what was their world of what they thought Jedi was was this. As time goes by, it continues to grow and grow and grow until they start seeing, hey, having an equity lens, a Jedi lens, is actually an effective way of doing my work. And they start getting to the space of just applying an equity lens in, in everything they do. So I also just want to use the, the river metaphor a little bit further that knowing that um, there's gonna be times where there's gonna be some rough rapids, there's gonna be some twists and turns, um, there might be some flooding, some like, what is going on? Um, there's gonna be some smooth sailing, um, some straight shots, uh, obstacles such as boulders and felled logs and rocks, and this is all part of the work. Just because you commit to something new, as many of you know, we'd like to have these things smooth sailing, but most often they're not. And I'm gonna tell you more about the, the challenges and what that would look like as we move forward. Um, so the other thing is start with why. Why is, why is Jedi important to you? Why is it important to your team? Why is it important to your organization? Why is it important to your department? Um, start there. Have those discussions and be clear of why it's important. I, I started my, my talk with why, um, if you noticed. Yeah, this guy named Simon Sinek, he has a TED talk and a book about starting with why. Um, he, he argues that oftentimes organizations and businesses and politicians start the other way around. They start with the what. And then they start thinking like, hey, how are we gonna do this? And then maybe get to the why. And um, so for example, he shared MLK's I have a dream speech. MLK said, I have a dream, not I have a plan, right? So I have a plan would have been the what, and it wouldn't have been that inspirational, and we probably wouldn't be talking about it much. But he talked about why and his vision for what America could be with well, I have a dream, and it's gone down the annals of history of one of the most inspirational speeches, the most important speeches of us as a country that we've encountered. So start with why. The, the other piece is why it's important is, is so, especially if you're with a team or an organization, to be on the same page in understanding why are we moving, doing this work. 
it becomes a North Star to continue to connect to, to guide you, as well as you're going to be asked. You're going to be asked by your partners, by people outside the organization. Why, why are we doing this? Or sometimes those tough days, they'll be like, why are we doing this? And I've been there before. It's like, oh, I want to throw in the towel. Actually, when I, when I led the Center for Diversity in the Environment, I would, I would quit, quit every other month, something like that. And, um, and it was just met my way of dealing with, with, with the work. Um, and the first time I did that, my wife was super, super concerned. Like, oh my gosh, you're quitting. You're gonna, you're, what are you going to do? Da, da. And I came in the next day. I'm like, no, it was just, it was just my way of being able to, to deal with this work. And what, what got me back on track is always connecting to my why, especially my personal why, of really supporting the other onlys out there, as well as creating the space for a successful movement for, for other um, for the next generation of folks. Um, so, so you'll see, notice in the next part of the ring is the how. Um, and be, be really wary. There's going to be a lot of pressure and a lot of discussions around what do we do? Jedi work, what do we do? Be careful of falling into this checklist approach. Like, oh, we need to do a training. Oh, we just did that. Check. Oh, let's create a statement. We did that. Check. Oh, we, we, have, we have that partnership with that group. I don't know if it went well or not, but check. We did it. Hey, we have this program over there. Check. Hey, we hired that person of color. Oh, we have that board member of color. Check. Okay? That's a very dangerous place to be in. And more likely, if you have that checklist mentality, you're actually going to be doing more damage than good. Um, so, so the way to remedy that is really start thinking about if this conversation starts getting into the what do we do, taking a step back, hey, let's start with why. Why are we doing this? Why is it important to have people of color on the board? Why is it important to, to work with this or that community? Even addressing that why helps combat tokenism. Okay? It helps combat tokenism. Because if you don't have a why, then some people will just be happy like, oh, we have that person of color. Isn't that good enough? I'll just tell you that. No, it's not, it's not good enough to just have a person of color on something just because they're a person of color. Have that discussion of why, and then have the discussion on how you're gonna be doing the work together. So once you have people of color on your board and your staff and your team, how are you gonna work together? How are you gonna move, how are you gonna start bringing the values of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the very work that you do? And, and I just wanna let you know that happens a lot for for leaders and organizations at the beginning stages of this work to talk about Jedi, but not actually be doing Jedi. So, so when I talked about this triangle, um, even creating a DEI statement for your organization, there's a way to do it inclusively and there's a way to not doing it inclusively. Okay? Inclusive, how do you bring everybody's voice in the organization that's going to be they're gonna be able to see their voice within this Jedi statement. Or is it just a team of one or two people, executive director, that's gonna create a statement and say, hey, this is our organizational statement. That's not an inclusive way and that's not gonna last very long. So focus, focus on the how. Um, expect and accept mistakes. I know this is hard for some of you. Um, and one of the most common recommendations for organizations in the middle stages of this work is actually sharing, because a lot of, lot of organizations at the beginning stages are, are asking, like, hey, what, what do you recommend? What do we need to look out for? What are some lessons learned? And one of the big lessons learned, one of the big recommendations they say is expect that you're going to make mistakes. It's, it's going to happen. So what are you going to do when you make the mistake? What are the, how are you going to tend to impact when that happens? Your intent was there, yes, great, good intent. Oftentimes in this work, especially at the beginning stages, the impact and the outcome doesn't always match the good intent. So what happens when you make that mistake, when you, you do that wrong approach, work, and you offend that community of color that you're working with? What happens when you lose that incredible staff member of color or that board member of color um, because some things went down, right? There's going to be mistakes. So how do you tend to impact? Put a plan in place. Talk about it. Um, 
a big part of this work is, and I'm going to do more around this in the workshop tomorrow, is emotional intelligence. Um, this isn't just a heady thing to do, it's a heart thing to do, and there's emotions that come up. And if you have these conversations and put emotions to the side, you're only going to get so far. But if you have the space and to be able to bring in and accept, like, hey, there's going to be emotions. I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm, um, I'm really excited. I'm, I feel really included. I feel special, right? These are all strong components of the work. And there's actually a whole institute out in Southern California called um, the Emotional Intelligence, Intelligence and Diversity Institute. Um, great resource if you're looking for um, some, some trainings or, or something, um, a deeper dive into that work. So I wanted to share, <laughs> I mean, this quote, open, open mouth insert. So I have, um, there's a woman who, uh, when I was at the Center for Diversity and Environment, was in one of my leadership development programs. And she's, she's a rock star. She continues to be, to move the mantle forward in Portland. And um, I, I connected with her a few months ago. And she said in this group, very in a very vulnerable space, saying, I've, I've come to enjoy the taste of my foot in my mouth. And it had a lot of laughs. I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to explore that with you. Let's talk. And what, what's happening is, is she's, she's going to the spaces that may be uncomfortable for her. She's going to these spaces that are stretching her. She's being vulnerable. Um, and, and she has all the best intent. And then she recognizes, though, when there are times that she does have, make mistakes, and she's the type of person that's going to step in, that's going to really see and be relational with the people or the person she may have offended, and have a discussion, and, and will continue to learn. Um, and that in of itself, the characteristic of growth, they'll talk about some of this growth mentality, willingness to learn, um, is, is, is really important in this work. Um, number six, don't be a dino. So Sean Watts of SM Watts Consulting out of Seattle coined this term in a, just a discussion. This, this, these great fun things happen when you have these discussions. And what he means is uh, dino diversity and name only. So there are too many leaders and organizations in the environmental space that, that really talk a good game around, around Jedi. But when you look at the substance of what they're doing in their organization, there's nothing there. Um, so don't do that. It's, it's, if you're going to do the Jedi work, be all in or be all out. Um, when you do this, um, as Big Daddy Kane says, ain't no half-stepping, um, don't half-step in this work because it's actually going to put you in a place that's, that's going lead to um, lead to actually less success. All right, number five. Um, how, are we doing, how are we doing on time? Am I over? Okay, just keep on going. Okay, but quicker is what I said. So, number five, create a Yellowstone. Okay, so Yellowstone is a very healthy ecosystem now. Um, so I'm, it's a space where all species that live there can thrive. Um, I just want to emphasize that, that this create an ecosystem within your organization where all people can thrive. What is that healthy ecosystem? where any person from any walk of life can come in and step in and flourish. Um, so create that Yellowstone. And I do want to recognize that many of the organizations are, are monocultures. It's a very homogenous culture, and, and they expect new people to come in and, and to follow that culture. But to understand to do inclusion well and do Jedi, Jedi well, there needs to be a shift and change of your culture every time you have folks come to your um, organization. Next, place the wolves in Yellowstone. Please place the wolves in Yellowstone. This is what I mean. If people of color are wolves, okay. there's times where you can create a space where if I enter, I can succeed, or you can set up a space for me to fail. And by, just to let you know, by doing nothing is setting up people of color to fail. Okay because you're expecting them to, it's like, as my, my buddy Vu Le, who has a great blog, says it's non, non-profit AF, he says it's like, it's like taking the best player, soccer player in the world, but asking them to go play football, okay? You have these smart, intelligent, great people, but you're asking them to play a different game. 
okay? And the best soccer player eh, is going to be okay at football. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll get, kick a couple of um, field goals, but that's about it. But so think about this. Um, what if someone decided to put wolves in the Amazon? That wouldn't succeed, right? That wouldn't happen. So don't do that either. R recognize when, when and, and forgive me if I'm stretching this metaphor, but I'm loving it. Um, but create the space where the wolves can succeed. And, and I do also want to recognize there's this, there's this weird thing around, Marcelo, you're saying play, put, telling white people to put people of color in spaces. It sounds kind of weird, but it's actually the reality of the way our movement works, of who holds power and privilege within the movement and within our organizations. Um, white people are in powerful positions and can do a lot of really beautiful things and support if they're doing this work well. Um, they're in um, gatekeeper roles, which is a term that's often used. Um, and and the, the, these, these challenges that people of color have in, in, in these groups are oftentimes because they're set up to, to fail. Um, growth mindset, I'm doing some study around, studies around um, the effective DEI, DEI capacity building activities within environmental groups and one of the most common things I've seen, characteristics for groups that are doing this work well and continue to doing is this, is this growth mindset. It's okay to fail. Let's learn, let's continue to grow. Let's not get perfectionism, perfectionism, which is actually an, an enemy to this work. It keeps organizations and individuals from actually doing the work and advancing. Um, so continue to have that growth mindset. Um, one of my favorite sayings is go slow to go fast. So, so play on that is go sloth to go fast. And this came up with, um, I, I uh, led, moderated a panel um, and I asked the panelists what, if they were an animal, what would you be? Or, or actually, what, was your, what would be your superhero name? And one panelist said, um, super sloth. And she said, because doing diversity, equity, inclusion work, you, you need to go slow, you need to be intentional, sloths, every movement, there's a purpose. Um, they're thoughtful, um, they're moving slower, but they survive, right? And, and going slow to go fast is one thing that's really important in this work. All right, there's too many donut holes. Um, change starts as a donut hole. So this is what I mean. There's different levels of change that you can make on the personal level, organizational level, and movement level. Change always starts at the personal level. So it's at the hole, it's at the core, it's the core of this work. So if you wanna see change at the organizational level, you wanna see it at the movement level, start with yourself, okay? That's one of the most empowering things that I've encountered in this work. When I get frustrated and I'm looking across the movement or I'm looking at this organization or that organization, I start pointing fingers around and behaving badly. What changes when I point fingers? Nothing. But when I point that finger back and be, I know there's things that I can do that I could change and I can continue to move and build on the craft that I've been committed to be doing. And the number one um, recommendation I have for you is, is, is love. Um, l when I brought in love to the work that I do, I've succeeded 100% of the time. I don't know if there's anything in my life that has that much of a success rate. 100% of that, 100% of the time. Um, and, and I want to talk about um, this type of love called agape love. Um, and it's the love that's selfless, that's sacrificial, that's unconditional love. Um, it's, the, it's the love that comes into place when um, you hear folks saying, love your enemies. And, and I'd like to say, like, you, you know, they're, they're, uh, enemies is kind of a strong word, but when there's conflict and tension happening, where ego comes involved and it prevents me from seeing you and who you are, it's when I get to this humble space, I, I realize, like, this is someone... This is someone, a human being in front of me that, that, that has issues and has concerns, some of the same hopes and concerns that I do. Um, and when I break down those barriers that I'm putting up myself and open myself to love and have an open heart, that's when the change happens. And in order for change to happen, we need to engage our heart and our head in this work. And I think as a movement, we're doing a pretty good job at engaging the head, finding rationale, reasons why we need to protect the environment, bringing science into this work, great. 
we're, we're, we're doing A plus in that area. I think what we need to do better at is engaging the heart and connecting to people and seeing them and connecting to where they are and who they are and where they come from. I am so strongly about love as this, it's, it's not only the beautiful way, but the practical way of moving forward that I'm actually starting a blog called Jedi Heart um, and the tagline is navigating justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion with love in the environmental movement. Um, so I want to close with this, that the promise of Jedi done well is a more successful movement. That is the promise. It takes you and me to ensure that we're doing this well. Um, and I know I threw a lot at you expecting you to grow, tend to your mistakes, create a Yellowstone for wolves, be a donut hole, a sloth, be like the Colorado River, uh, start with why, then focus on the how, grow, tend to impact, don't be a dino, and then expecting to do this all with love. So if I want to say one thing, if, if it's hard to remember all those pieces, start with those final two. S start with you, the, d the donut hole, and, and, and start with love. And, and if you start with those two pieces and each of us do this in, this in this room together, then we will do this work. Jedi will be done well, and we will have a more successful movement. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Marcel. We have time for a couple questions. So please raise your hand. I'll run over with the mic. No I was so thorough. <laughs> There's no questions. No questions. Ask, ask them. Anything you're curious about. We, we have here and then we'll go back there. I just wanted to ask about the date for the research that you had, the Nature mm -hmm. Conservancy. You said it was kind of older and had been taken down, but I was just wondering when that was taken. Uh, that was around 2010, 2011. Yeah. Nice. Don't pull a, pull a muscle. That was great, thank you. Um, thank you. I, so I'm, I'm just curious, and I, I really appreciate your, your points. One you're making, though, is it seems a lot like you're saying start, right? Mm -hmm. And the question is, um, oftentimes, that's presupposing pre we're starting from zero. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think a lot, of, um, a lot of folks are starting somewhere in the middle, right? And building on, or uh, building off of, or grappling with a legacy of what's been done before. So it's really not just starting with that, it's sort of you're having to pick up somewhere that there's institutional challenges, there's work mm. that's been done that maybe wasn't as effective, these sorts mm. of things. So mm. in broad strokes, I think these all work well. I'm just curious in terms of your experience, um, what's the most effective way to uh, make change in systems that have already sort of had a base, uh, a long, a long-standing history of. I don't want to say ineffective, you, but can, but can you explain more what you mean by starting in the middle? Well, I think what I heard a lot, and this is just my impression of what you were saying. Oftentimes, you're saying start with love, start with these sorts of things, and to mm -hmm. me, that sounds like we're saying we're starting with from zero. We're starting over. Mm -hmm. We're starting from a you know mm -hmm. at the at the starting line. Right, we're in, oftentimes we're in the middle of sort of the, the race already. Okay, I'm going to explore this a little bit more with you because th I'm thinking we may be coming from different spaces. So, when you, so I was talking about actually intentionally doing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. So, are you saying most people in the room have been doing that work for the while and are at the middle stages of the work? I, I don't know everybody in this room. I'm saying for those of, for those folks who have been doing it, I think that's that's then the challenge is having put some of those pla things in place is uh, you're, working in, you're working in a system, right, that, that you're not at the starting line, you're actually in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, when often the challenges uh, start. What, what I've seen is very, uh, start the, the, some of the initial phases are, mm -hmm. are pretty successful. Mm -hmm. It's actually getting the middle ones that they start Got to it. kind of drop Got off. It. And that's kind of where I'm Are you coming at. to the workshop later? I uh, see, yes. Okay. We'll be talking about the middle stages and what's there for, for groups. And, and I do want to say in a caveat, though, a lot of groups that I come into that are at the middle stages of this work, um, there, there's always an opportunity to get grounded in the many concepts that, that I share. And the concepts that I'm sharing really are addressing a lot of common mistakes and challenges that I see. 
even for groups in the middle stages. Um, and, and, and so I just, I just wanted to address that, and, and we'll have further discussions in the workshop. Great. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Say, so, uh, how do you see faith-based people, so to speak, and communities fitting into what you've been discussing? Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think, I think, I mean, that's a question that I would love to have with other faith-based people in in the room. But a lot, a lot of my work is, is core principles within Christianity, within what Jesus was about. Um, I know there's this. Um, Unfortunately, there's a part of the political space where um, a certain segment of, of Christians, and I'm just going to talk about Christian faith right now, of, have co-opted. What's that? Yeah, I'm just going to share from my, from my perspective. Um, so so all, a lot of this work in, in the values that are being talked about, are can, you can find them grounded in the Christian faith. And, and I'll just share that because I'm not as, that's what I am. I'm a Christian. I'm not as familiar with, with other faiths. But I think, um, I, think, I think one thing we can all do, if you're doing it already, continue it is to engage across faith. Because when you start looking at different faiths, there is a grounding in connecting and taking care of our planet and where we live. Um, and we just need to look for it, and we need to explore that with, with the multiple faiths that are out there. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Our tradition is to hand out a, a, a framed um, um, certificate of appreciation to you. Um, I guess we maybe ran out of frames. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we've got a certificate we'll be giving you tomorrow as an, uh, a thank you for your uh, participation in our program. And we've been in this for seven years. So um, we are, um, we feel like this, uh, um, there's a lot of these floating out there, and we really appreciate people's commitment to it. Um, I really appreciate what you said um, today. I will share with you, there will be some workshops this afternoon and tomorrow, um, but this is a conversation at least the School of Environment and Natural Resources hopes to continue to facilitate for the foreseeable future. So um, if, you, uh, if any of this resonated with you or over the next couple of days, if you have further ideas on follow-ups to this, we'd love to sort of like integrate this as a theme in future EPNs. So um, we appreciate everybody's participation today, and uh, um, we um, um, want to continue the conversation in a variety of contexts and move things forward. Uh, as you know, we try to make the EPN a breakfast a zero waste event. Um, please help reduce your footprint and enhance our reuse of materials by paying close attention to the signs and instructions. You have to kind of squint at the uh, at the, so the guidance there, but if you uh, need some help, we'll have some people here helping you figure out how to locate things. But uh, we've really tried to reduce the, uh, uh, the footprint here of the, this event, and we appreciate your support in that. Please turn to the back of your program to identify future upcoming EPN events. I did want to uh, highlight the March 5th event um, we'll do with the Waste Management Association of Ohio, Ohio Water Resource Center, and Terra Aqua Student Organization. I'm delighted to report that the uh, um, new director of EPA will be also on the panel that time. So we're delighted to have her with us um, uh, next month, and that should be a great program. And then our signature event, the one we always look forward to in the Ohio Union on April 8th, uh, will continue sort of like a question of diversity um, as we uh, welcome a, a couple um, well-known speakers to discuss climate change environmental justice and the role of women in environmental conservation. So we're really looking forward to the future program. We hope you can join us for those events. Um, thank you for uh, your time today and uh, um, have a great week. Thank you. <laughs>